Hello everybody and welcome to this video. It's a continuation in the series on the Merchant of Venice. I've already provided a lot of analysis of the scenes, but I want to provide a line-by-line -line translation into modern English of the original Shakespearean text. Everything I go through in this series of videos comes from Mr. Bruff's Guide to Merchant of Venice, the Merchant of Venice I should say, available for £3.99 at mrbruff.com. So, the original text then starts Act 1, Scene 1 in Venice in a street, and Antonio, Salarino and Solano enter. And Antonio says, In sooth I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me, you say it wearies you, but how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff it is made of, where it is born, I am to learn. And what is he saying here? Well, he's saying, you know, the truth is I don't know why I am so sad. So we're joining the action, you know, part way through what's obviously taken place before this. Antonio telling us that he feels sad. He says, it drains me. You say it drains you, but how I came to feel like this, the cause or where it's come from, I don't know. And then he goes on to say in the original, and such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. In other words, you know, I've got such a, a lack of insight regarding my own sadness that it, it makes me feel as if I don't know myself. Now, there are various uh, ideas about why Antonio is so sad, and I go through those in the analysis, but let's have a look at Solerio's response. Your mind is tossing on the ocean, there where your argosies with uh, portly sail, um, like seniors and rich burghers on the flood, or as it were, the pageants of the sea, do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. Now what Solerio is saying here is, look, your thoughts are focused on the ocean. Uh, that's where your ships are, with their grand sails, and the ships are like gentlemen and rich inhabitants of the ocean, like a spectacular seaborne procession. They look down on little boats, which politely and respectfully move out of the way as they fly past with their sails billowing. And this gives us important backstory about Antonio. And in the analysis videos and in the ebook, I talk about how Salarino and Solano just appear as almost chorus like figures to kind of give us the backstory that is important for the plot, because obviously knowing that the ships of Antonio's wealth are at sea and he's worried about them, his friends think he's worried about them because they might uh, wreck, uh, you know, foreshadows and hints at what is later to come. Solanio says, Believe me, sir, had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should still, plucking the grass to know where sits the wind, peering in uh, maps for ports and piers and roads and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my adventures, uh, out of... Sorry, I've, I've lost where I am. Uh, out of doubt would make me sad. Now, what he's saying here is quite clear. He's saying, look, if I had business like yours, most of my attention would be focused on my ships at sea. I would be constantly throwing grass into the air to find out which direction the wind is blowing in. I would be constantly scrutinising maps for ports, for piers, for roads, and anything that caused me to worry about my ship's safety uh, would definitely make me sad. And so, so really, this is a friend who's trying to uh, you know, calm down, um, uh, you know, Antonio and say, look, you know, you, you've got every right to be upset. And then Salarino says, my wind cooling my broth would blow me to an egg when I thought would ha what harm a wind too great at sea might do. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, veiling her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching but my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices on the stream, enrobe the roaring waters with my silks, and in a word, but even now worth this, and now worth nothing? Shall I have the thought to think on this, and shall I lack the thought that such a thing bechanced would make me sad? But tell me... Uh, tell not me, I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. So, interesting to note that this character, 
Salarino is also uh, known in some various variations of the text as Salerio. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying, well, you know, if this was me, every time that I blow on my soup to cool it down would give me a fever when I thought about the damage a storm at sea could do. I wouldn't be able to look at the sand flowing through an hourglass without thinking of shallow waters and sandbars and imagining my valuable ship, Andrew, that's the name of the ship, run aground, listing severely as she shipwrecked. If I went to church and looked at the building's stonework, I would think straight away of dangerous rocks, which if they damaged my ship's hull, hull would cause the cargo of spices to be washed away. My silks would be thrown about in the stormy seas, one moment having wealth and suddenly having nothing. If I think about this and ponder the possibility, can I deny that the possibility of such a disaster would make me sad? But don't answer me. I know that Antonio is concerned for the safety of his cargo. And in some ways, as well as giving us some important backstory, this is quite a comic scene, isn't it? Because his friends are trying to sort of say don't be sad, you know, I know you're sad, uh, you know, but try not to be. And they're kind of talking to Antonio about, you know, you're sad because you, your ships might be dashed on the rocks and you might lose everything. It's not going to do a very good job at calming him down to make him think about the reason he is supposedly sad. But then Antonio speaks. Now, Antonio is a key character in the entire play. Salarino and uh, Salerio are not. And... Um, you know, Antonio now speaks and he says, uh, believe me, no, I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. So Antonio, after listening to this long um, explanation of his grief from his friends basically says believe me no I am very fortunate that my business interests are not invested in just one ship nor in one country uh, nor is my entire wealth dependent on doing well financially this year so it's not my business which is making me sad now this again gives us a little clue hang on a minute you know you've got lots of ships but we learn later of course that he's going to lose all of those ships so it's a sort of false confidence here. And Salarino says, why then you are in love? In other words, you know, well, if, you, if you're not sad about your business, it must be because you're in love. Now, there is a very popular analysis that perhaps Salar uh, Antonio is sad uh, because his friend, Bassanio, is pursuing a woman and he loves Bassanio. It's never stated explicitly as any homosexual themes uh, were not in Shakespeare's time, but it certainly seems to tie in. But... Of course, Antonio replies, fie, fie, which means, oh, for goodness sake. Um, now, then we have Salarino saying, not in love neither. Then let us say you are sad because you are not merry, and where it's easy for you to laugh and leap and say you are merry because you are not sad. Now, by two-headed Janus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time, some that will evermore peep through their eyes and laugh like parrots at a bagpiper, and others of such vinegar aspect that they'll not show their teeth in way of a smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. So what's he saying here? He's saying, well, you're not in love either? Well, let's just say you're sad because you're not happy, and it's as easy as that. Uh, it's easy for you to laugh and dance and say you're happy because you're not sad. Now by two-headed Janus, we're also different. Some whose eyes are always crinkled with laughter, laugh at things which aren't even funny, and others so sour-faced that they never crack a smile, no matter how funny the joke is. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video there, and uh, do come back to see the next part of this series tomorrow.